Good evening. This is Redwood Wonk. My name's Eric Kirk. I'm with David Frank. We are going to discuss the national politics of the day. We're going to start with uh, what the you know the one of the main to actually there are a lot of topics, but one of the main uh, parts of the news these days is the Delta variant. Um, nearly all of the new infections are Delta variant. It is extremely catchy, much more um, easy to catch it than. Than, than the previous. Some people are saying that it should be called COVID-21 rather than COVID-19, that it may even be considered totally different. Uh, we still are lagging behind in vaccinations, although we'll talk a little bit about uh, how uh, we might be starting to catch up now that Republicans are realizing that it's their constituents are dying um, and they're, they're in kind of a panic, some of them. Um, Asa Hutchinson, uh, governor of Arkansas, says he wishes he hadn't signed the anti-masking bill that he signed uh, some weeks back because they need the mask um, mandates. Florida um, DeSantis uh, is slipping in polls um, uh, due to his um, due due to you know the policies. They're losing a little bit of faith in them because uh, Florida appears to be the epicenter, even though the vaccination rate is a little bit higher than some of the other southern states and the death rate hasn't quite caught up yet to some of the other states. It's 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 there. Last week it matched, it actually exceeded New Jersey's um death rate. And um anyway, it, uh, a lot happening, a lot of sniping between Biden and DeSantis. DeSantis is basically putting all of his um, bet, betting money into the economy rather than worrying about um, the um, the uh, um, the the virus. Uh, you know the calculation he's making. But other governors, as we talked last time, governor of Alabama is just frustrated with the people who will not vaccinate. Um, there are more people vaccinating now. The rates have started to pick up. I think we finally met Biden's goal of, um, I forget what it was, uh, 70% 70, 70 of people have gotten at least one shot uh, a month late. But there are still people who refuse to be vaccinated, and even people who got really sick from it, um, or, or their kids did, because they aren't going to let government tell them what to do. Um, it's about choice. It's about freedom. Uh, to other people, it's just about survival. Um, you know, even even locally, it looks like we're probably going to have a mask mandate. Eureka has one, and it looks like it'll probably go back countywide. Um, Thirty-year-old man died yesterday. I, you know, I don't know the circumstances of it, um, <clears throat> but it's um it's scary times and um it, some people are saying this could be worse than the last one i don't know that the virus is any deadlier than the last one but it's definitely easier to catch it's spreading them around and i think they're saying something like 80 90 percent of the new infections are delta variant dave yeah so like you said the delta variant is like uh basically going running wild um, in many places around the world. I guess the worldwide caseload is now over 200 million. Um, and here within our country, you know, there's there are many states where the uh, uh, infection rates kind of gone parabolic, where it's there's geometric progression over the previous uh, two week period. Um, so that's the impact is really there. And, you know, as you as you I uh, think um, what we were talking about um, in a prior week, um, you know, the CDC did, uh, in fact, kind of identify that there are areas of concern um, where they are making recommendations for for, you know, to as a return to some of the more severe uh, lockdown or, or, you know, not lockdowns rather, but mask mandates. Um, so, because of this spread. Uh, and then here locally also, we are at the worst uh, levels of infection uh, compared to any other time, or certainly this time last year. I think we're uh, down to four ICU beds right now. Yeah, I, I didn't hear that exact number, but it, um, I know we don't have very many to, <laughs> to start with. So, uh, but it, it's definitely of concern. And yeah, like you you also mentioned that our community is going to uh, transition to, I think the decision's been made, it was announced earlier today, uh, Friday evening at midnight, which is like a Saturday, first thing in the morning, um, we're going to have an indoor mandate 
um, because of sp stopping the spread. Basically, because they've they've got enough data now to know that even if you're vaccinated, uh, you still can you'll still have that same viral load, which means you'll still spread it. Um, yeah. Now, of course, you're not going to have as many hospitalizations. You're not going to have as much death, um, but you will be a carrier and you can spread it. And that's why, because with, say, you know, 40, depending on your community, uh, the, you know, approximately 40 to 30 or 40 percent of the people unvaccinated, it's going rampant in those communities. It, it is. And, you know, they are there are talks now of vaccine uh, mandates. Uh, companies are now I mean, there's a big growing list of companies who are saying you want to work for us, you better vaccinate. Um, and there's a lot of resistance to that and saying, well, I'm going to sue. But there, there's no uh, discrimination on the basis of I don't want to be vaccinated. There's no that's not a suspect class in discrimination law. They can they especially if it's a bona fide requirement um, they can require it um, and they and they may go to not away from the honor system um, you know and move I was just in Disneyland last week and you check a box that says you're vaccinated and uh, but you know because no they're not going to check on it they may actually be demanding the uh, vaccine passport at this point in time uh, New York City I believe you're going to have to prove it to uh, get into an indoor gym or a restaurant. Um, and, um, and, you know, it's just, what's a shame is that we might have been able to have this, had this thing under control. Delta variant might not have even had a chance to evolve in this country, um, you know, if, if we had had more people vaccinated, but the, the resistance to it, um, is you know is enormous where you know other countries people are literally dying because they can't get it um and so it's just it's it's a real sad state of affairs how it's going to affect the politics um and, and what what's going to come of it well you know the, the political end of it is the republicans are in a panic some of them are still pulling the pandering card not they aren't all um you know willing to do it but the others i think are realizing whoa we need voters to you know live until the midterm if we're going to retake congress i mean and so you got mcconnell lindsey graham apparently tested positive and said thank you know th is thankful that he took the vaccine um but it's uh, yeah, it's a it's it's going to possibly get worse before it gets better. Um, and um, and, you know, it's a shame because it could have been under a lot more closer to being under control. Yeah, and so much of this has to do with vaccination levels, and um, it's not just um, people that are politically resistant or, or um, you know, have this mistrust or skepticism. There's also, um, for, you know, beyond it just being a political issue, there's variation uh, also by race. There's variation by economic, socioeconomic status, um, okay. with people who are mistrustful of the healthcare system for, from past discrimination. Um, having a, a uh, you know, the lowest, like for example, the black population of America is about just 37%, I think I heard the most recent number, and with maybe closer to 50 for, for white and Latino people, right. citizens, and then, you know, Asian people about 80%. So, the, so there's a variety of reasons here. Um, one thing I want, would just mention real quickly too is um, I saw the governor of South Carolina over the weekend speak, and he was basically saying, "We're not mandating anything. We want people to use their common sense. I'm vaccinated. You should use your common sense," which is right. still progress. It is progress. I mean, that's um, yeah. It, it, I mean, I, it's probably unconstitutional to mandate that you have to be vaccinated. Period. But. It's it's not a right. It's a privilege to work in a certain place, you know, or to be able to enter a certain building. They you you could be barred from it. You may not be allowed into baseball games and uh, and the like um, if if you're not vaccinated. And that's going to cause a lot of issues for people who see it as a matter of choice. Um, it's like yeah, it's a choice, but. You, you, the choice choices have consequences. You don't. You aren't guaranteed a lack of consequences for your choice. You're only guaranteed a lack of legal consequences. And um, and so you know, we'll see. I you know again the. The, I think people are getting scared, and, and again, people are starting to vaccinate in a lot of those areas. Uh, San Francisco has herd immunity. I mean, their ICO beds are empty. And they're, oh, they're they're actually taking in people. So it's just because they got something like 90% vaccination rate. Granted, you know, San Francisco is much more up 
uh, you know, upper um, class and um, and very well educated in science and the rest. But even the communities, uh, the the marginalized communities in San Francisco are better off in terms of vaccinations. Um, probably better outreach program. Uh, you know, I don't know. Um, it's also smaller than other cities. You know, easier to get things to places. But anyway, final thoughts on this topic, Dave. Uh, real quickly, one thing to mention is in South in uh, San Francisco, the University of San Francisco did have an outbreak amongst a highly vaccinated population of doctors. So it is spreading. It's just that it's not impacting as severe with like a 0 0.0003 incidence of hospitalization and death. Yeah. So it's yeah. spreading, but it's not it's not, uh, you know, it, with the le uh, less of an impact, certainly. Good news and bad news all at once. All right, that takes us to the next topic. All right, we've been discussing this for weeks. Hopefully, you know, something's going to happen finally with the infrastructure bills. Um, the uh, it, it it sounds, I, I heard Kirsten Sinema, one of the brokers, uh, you know, quote unquote, moderate brokers, uh, being optimistic that this was going to pass very soon. Um, you know, I think they're one of the issues is going to be increasing the debt level. Uh, it looks like Democrats may be boxing um, Republicans in on that, not wanting to pass that just on their own, but actually they may get enough Republican support. I'm not exact. I tried to find out exactly what's in the infrastructure bill. I'm seeing a lot of generalities and stuff, but it's clearly not finished uh, being written. But it does seem like for whatever reason it's going to happen, Trump had called for the Republicans to pull out of the talks um, and, and out of the process and vote against it. But they, they don't seem to be wanting to go down with this ship. Uh, they, they seem to have made the calculation that if they don't pass something, they're going to have a hard time in their re-elections. Um, you know, I it, it's I, again hard to know what's happening. They're being interviewed all over the place, but all they keep saying, "Oh, and we're excited. It's about to, to happen." Nobody's contradicting them. Uh, Dave. Um, yeah. So it, you know, some of the most recent kind of machinations behind the scenes, big picture, are that uh, you know I think uh, Senator Schumer was trying to make sure he gets this through the Senate. Uh, or at least trying, you know, before the uh, August break, which is you mm -hmm. know, probably the end of the week or something like very soon. And, the, you know, Nancy Pelosi in the House is basically saying we're not going to advance the simultaneous bipartisan infrastructure bill and the budget reconciliation bill. We're not going to advance those two things together until we see this bill get out of the Senate. These bills get out of the Senate because um, mm -hmm. she knows it's so precarious. So there's this tension, there's this pressure on Schumer, and to slow the roll and to just kind of put a little monkey wrench into the system, um, the Republican senators that are uh, adding amendments to the bill. Have, you know, I think the number is nearly 300 amendments. Uh, just a small handful of people are putting in a dozen or three dozen amendments each. Right. Um, really trying to monkey it up. But in that process, they're slipping in things like let's waive union labor. So there's a lot of special sort of preferential treatment. And one that's notorious that I saw people mention was that the cryptocurrency lobby has a lot of clout and they got, uh, you know, an immense amount of uh, leverage to get one of their pet features in on this so so it's a it's typical sausage making um but the bottom line is i think that uh, there is like i said a while ago my i think it was my first prediction that i made on the show um there is an incentive to bring home the bacon and to let people know that you're gonna in each of the 3,300 counties around the country all the legislators want to uh have projects and spending and and funding and to, to say that there's improvements in the community that they had a part of yeah, it looked like they tried to slip through finishing the wall and all that kind of stuff. But I think they knew that wasn't going to be accepted. I mean, it's um, I, he, he, like I said, but we don't, there's no like comprehensive list. They haven't released it. The bill isn't even written, right? I mean, they're, they're still, they, they don't have a draft of it that, that's being shared with the public. We just have, um, you know, all these vague things and vague notes and people trying to write things down and put reporters trying to put together what might be in the bill. Of course, we're talking, you know, in the bipartisan one, something close to 600 million billion in new money, as they're calling it. They're reallocating some of the other money uh, and the rest. And then lurking 
in the shadows is the reconciliation bill, which will either, you know, be a separate bill that the Democrats pass on their own, or you know, or or will possibly, if it all falls apart, will the Republicans just be swallowed up and they'll pass it anyway with that? And I think the Republicans just know the writing's on the wall. There's nothing they can do about that, so they might as well be able to take credit um, for for bringing home some bacon, so to speak. Um, <laughs> you know, it's um, it, it is um, it is what it is. Although it hasn't stopped them in the past from talking about you know they they still vote against bills and. And then still, you know, brag as if it's um, if it's something that um, they voted for. But um, but there's but this time Biden was going around saying, no, your your um, uh, pers- your your representative did not vote for this, you know. And so it, that's something Obama didn't do, but Biden appears willing to do. And uh, I think the Republicans don't want that. I think they're boxed in. Yeah. So a couple elements here. Um the with respect to the uh, bipartisan bill, it is like we've talked about before. This highlights the power of uh, Kristen Cinema and also um, Joe, uh, Manchin. Joe Manchin, right? So uh, this past weekend, uh, Joe Manchin had a party on his boat that had people from both both uh, p- both parties. He doesn't call it a party. He said it's not a party. It was just hamburgers and hot dogs while we cruised around my boat off the DC. Yeah, right. I think that's a party. Um, yeah. That's where Lindsey Graham got sick, and so um, they they're putting some you know touches together on how to how to get this thing through. I did see him go on um, one of the talk shows, I think Face the Nation over the weekend, where he was touting um, clean coal and the future of carbon sequestration for the coal industry. And uh, one of you know one of my colleagues pointed out, uh, well, he actually is a uh, owns a coal company or a very large interest in coal. And uh, he gets yeah, a lot of support. Is- he doesn't even need that for an incentive. But his he's that's the coal mining state. That's his right. votes. He's got to make promises that he can't keep. It's you know coal is going to be replaced by natural gas if nothing else. But it's um but he's got to keep making that play. Yeah, we got to yeah. a few coal is in our future, even though you know the writing's probably on the wall. And I would just say he says his piece, and then he gets the refill from the funding from you know other folks in the energy industry sector and again he's an establishment democrat uh, and so um it's just you know the party itself we talk about how they need to keep all 50 together um, in order to move anything along and uh it's pretty clear that uh he's he's in posturing if nothing else to try to extract the maximum possible leverage here and i think i've said this before my what i've heard and seen is that he wants to be the next governor of west virginia and so he's looking for some, you know, credibility slash allies that, hey, look, I said my piece, I stood up, I did what I could do. Wasn't he already governor or maybe I'm confusing him with somebody else? I would have to check. But He may have been. Yeah, I think he yeah. may have been. Um, to be honest, I think he was. But yeah. the current governor is a guy who's also an uh, energy industry guy. So it's mm-hmm. it's rotating chairs. Yeah. Well. Um, yeah, it's uh, at any rate, uh, you know, we, we keep reporting on this and uh, but it does look like it's going to happen. Kirsten Cinema would not be on NPR saying this is exciting. It's going to happen unless she was pretty certain it was going to happen. It sounds like everybody's being very pragmatic. Um, you know, the progressives are getting thrown some bones. I don't know what. But apparently, Biden, uh, pardon me, uh, Bernie is is at least satisfied with it. Um, AOC has even slowed down her criticisms of it. So you know, we'll we'll see. Uh, I think, it, and it uh, it does look like something that um, will pass. Um, yeah, real quickly, I, I'm, there there are talks that. Um, you know, they, that it's, it's like a win-win. So um, whatever it doesn't get, isn't in this bill, we'll get in that, um, you know, that reconciliation uh, reconciliation bill. So yeah, yeah, there's a lot like Bernie's happy, I'm sure, because there's literally trillions of dollars on the table. This is a major, major accomplishment that America will benefit from. Right. And we have confirmation Joe Manchin was governor, but maybe he wants to be again. It's, uh, uh, we'll see, Um, you know, it's, uh, maybe it's easier work. I don't know. All right, that brings us to the next topic. 
Today, we celebrate the triumph not of a candidate, but of a cause, the cause of democracy. We are going to raise issues that, you know, historically have not been raised. What about the nuclear option, doing away with the filibuster? I can tell you that would be the end of the Senate as it was originally devised. All of this is possible for America. Who was standing in the way? Mitch McConnell. Where an insurrection that sought to overturn an election, when that failed, the action moved into state capitals. Okay, um, Mario Cuomo, not Mario Cuomo, sorry, uh, Governor Cuomo, Mario Cuomo was the father. Andrew, um, Andrew Cuomo is in trouble. Uh, report came in, 11 women, it's about half as many as Trump, um, are making complaints, some of them real serious. I mean, sexual assault type stuff, touching their breasts, touching, you know, uh, kissing without um, consent, uh, stroking their stomach. Uh, he, they, it, it, it's at the point now that even President Biden is calling for his resignation. Um, it, it, Democrats are, they're threatening to impeach him. He's doubling down. I guess he thinks he's Donald Trump and can get away with it. He's probably in the wrong party for that. Um, you know, but he is uh, absolutely denying saying that they're just misinterpreting him, that that he he's you know physically um, affectionate because he's Italian. I, I mean, all kinds of bizarre stuff coming out. Supposedly, he's planning some big uh, press conference to push back, but the, the the calls for his resignation are almost universal. I don't know that he has any defenders at this point outside of his administration, and uh, it's just it's a bad report. You know, if it's one woman. It, it, making accusations, you could probably, you know, say, oh, it's a political attack, blah, blah, blah. Uh, two, possibly, but it gets harder. But when you've got 11 women, um, it's it's pretty much over. And, um, you know, this isn't the Republican Party where they where, where, where they seem to be in the position now where uh, it, as long as it's heterosexual, you're OK. Right. I mean, it's just um, uh, and, and, you know, and I guess the distinction they make is, well, Trump assaulted women when he wasn't in office. It matters more when you do it when you're in office. I guess it matters a little bit more in terms of your position. But um, Cuomo, uh, it's you know hard to see how he survives this. I, I don't know, but he's he's cocky as anything right now, and seems to be you know, under the impression that he, that he can weather this and turn it around. Yeah, it's kind of a sad day for. For folks who supported him, I suppose, because um, Attorney General Letitia James's, uh, you know, damning report was finally released, and uh, and it's it's everybody in the entire state apparatus of, of the Democratic Party, the national groups, you know, uh, both senators uh, Joe Lebrand and and Schumer, uh, the President Biden, all Democrats have all come out and said he needs to go. Uh, because of this. And basically, I would say that he's a kind of, I mean, not that I know him personally, but from all the things I've read and heard and, it, uh, and seen, um, he's, he's a, is a bully. That's his management style. Mm -hmm. They say mm -hmm. that he has two, he has uh, like two, two um, ways of going. He'll either, you know, go along with what's happening or he'll kill people, like, like, like run them off the, off the stage. So, so he's a ruthless politician that uses his power, uh, throws it around, and just kind of felt he could get away with it, and he stepped on a lot of toes. And it turns out that Letitia James was somebody who he did have a history with. She was a Working Families Party city council person, and um, when she was running for to be attorney general, the deal that she made with Governor Cuomo was um, – he basically, she had to denounce the Working Families Party in order to get his support and endorsement. So, mm -hmm. in a way, she she had this crisis uh, going on within her own, you know, psyche. And this is a boomerang effect, where now she had a damning and comprehensive report that uh, you know painted the picture that was sufficient to grease the skids for him to have to leave. And with almost no support, I don't know how he survives. I don't know either. I mean, there, there definitely will be an impeachment. New York has an impeachment process. Um, if, if he isn't out within the next week, there will be an, an impeachment um, happening. Um, I, it's just, you know, but, but the, the arrogance that he thinks he can do this and still, you know, stay in power. I think it's just this, there's a sense of entitlement that, that men, particularly men in power, seem to 
you know, feel like they, they can do this stuff and, and not have to face consequences. I mean, what was he thinking? I mean, 11 women, you know, that's, that's a lot. That's a, that's a, a spree. That isn't like, you know, one uh, momentary thing where maybe there was some sort of misunderstanding. You thought they were, you know, blah, blah, blah. That, this, that's a, um, like, Psychotic. I'm sorry. I mean, it's just it's uh, uh, there, and he again in complete denial, and it's such a turnaround because you know a year ago we were talking about how he might be the dark horse that came into the Democratic race and and uh, won the presidency, uh, and that that is yeah. long past. And for folks who don't remember, there was uh, a strong criticism from his own party, uh, the Assembly. Uh, in New York when there was the scandal last year of how they handled the nursing homes during right. COVID. And there was talk about how there was preferential treatment to, for vaccinations for family members and friends. And so he's kind of, you know, he's been accused of like in the uh, history of the world part one movie where the Mel Brooks character plays the King of France. And he says, it's good to be the King. So in a way he kind of rolls like, Hey, it's good to be the King. I just kind of do my thing and it all kind of rolls off me. This is kind of what, it's what is expected here. And this is just, you know, this is, it's like a, a you know, a, a, what you call it. People were, uh, Comparing it to like a mafia movie or something. Where yeah. He just sort of, you know, he comes from a dynasty and he felt has a sense of entitlement, like you said. And and he even was kind of gaslighting, just saying like, this is my character. I kiss people. I hug people. All this other yeah. stuff. You guys misinterpreted my kindness. Right. And it's like people were saying like, no, I was the police officer that was assigned, the New York State Trooper assigned to defend you. And witnesses watched you grope me. Like, how am I misinterpreting this? You know, and, and right. like I said, Letitia James got like, um, I think, 100 or more, you know, corroborating stories. And so it's 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 black and white. You know, it's so obvious that it's there's not room for interpretation of how they might have misread his signals. I don't think not that I'm the judge, jury and executioner, but just based on the stuff I heard, it, it just sounds pretty awful. It's a type of report where, you know, even if it was completely false, you might as well just resign and then fight it later, right? I mean, it's just there's, it, 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 the, if it was false, it would mean Letitia James just did a whole hit job on you and you're just not going to survive it because nobody's going to believe it until you can prove it. You might as well just quit and make it your your life duty at that point to do it. But there's just no way. There, like you said, there's too many witnesses um, involved, you know, and it's just, it, and he doesn't even look nervous about it. He's just in there thinking he's going to survive. But, well, probably because he's done this for years and always survived it before. You know, probably there have been complaints against him in, uh, in, in his other endeavors in the past. And just, uh, you know, but 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 times are changing. And, you know, as Al Franken learned, and he did a lot, lot less, you know, it, it was a comparable number of women. But, you know, what he did was nowhere near on the scale. And he was out. Um, like crazy, and um, I'm forgetting the name of the congresswoman. She was the one who pushed Franken to to resign right away. She's, uh, pardon me, the uh, senator in in New York, uh, the blonde one. I, uh, Jill, Gillibrand. Gillibrand, yeah. yeah. I mean, she was kind of holding off for a while, I, I think, because she got took a lot of flack over having pushed Franken out, you know, so quickly. Um, but. But there's nobody defending him now. He's 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 alone with the staff, and you know, and this is really going to be hard on the staff because they're going to not, not going to find work. They're going to be tainted now because they were all part of the cover up, right? You know. Yeah, so, yeah. And I was yeah. say, speaking of the cover up, um, it was said that um, his staff had a rule that was, um, you know, he couldn't be alone. He wasn't allowed to be alone with women, um, <laughs> just to try to protect him from himself. Right. And, uh, you know, some other things of that nature where it's like, you know, this is an ongoing thing. People kind of knew about it. And and I would like to highlight one thing that you mentioned, too, which is um, he's in the wrong party if he thinks that just that level of confidence, if, just you know, just standing up and, and, you know, like the Trump defense, the Trump defense is like, they're wrong. They're not my type. You know, yeah. get over it. Like that doesn't that doesn't fly in, in the party, the Democratic Party, or at least. It, it's less likely to fly in the Democratic Party, I think, because, like you said, times have changed. People are acutely aware. And, and this is actually something I almost forgot to mention. Um, 
you know, I, I'm nearly 50 years old and I can tell mm-hmm. you, I grew up and I saw a transition over time of how things were dealt in my work and career. But sometimes about uh, sometime about 20 years ago, I remember like mandatory sexual harassment training. And, uh, you know, maybe it's not annual, but like biannual, most companies I've ever worked for, if not every company I've ever worked for, uh, requires training in how to, uh, you know, carry yourself and what constitutes uh, you know, unacceptable behavior. You have to think this guy's gotten some training in his life. Somebody sat him down and just said, this is illegal. You know, you this is grounds for dismissal, or at the very least, this is highly, highly unethical. And obviously it's that, you know, it hasn't, it didn't sink in or he thought he was above it. And, you know, that's, that's a psychosis almost to think you're above that. Right. Really quickly, before we get to the next topic, he actually does have one defender. Rudy Giuliani. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) He's saying he's being mistreated and and misunderstood. So anyway. That helps, right? uh, No, I'm not sure I would want that. But um, all right. Uh, Trump did call for his resignation. But okay, Uh, Corey Bush, the new progressive heroine, um, has managed to accomplish at least something temporarily. Uh, Of course, the eviction moratorium, the first one, has basically expired. Um, we are, it's not the full moratorium, but CDC did go ahead and extend it for 30 days. A lot of questions about its legality. In fact, one of the um, Supreme Court members, I forget which one, had actually warned back in June saying, don't extend this on your own uh, to, to Biden, you know, in terms of whether or not, uh, th- this question is whether or not Congress even has um, the legal right to impose a, a nationwide moratorium. Um, the um, but but certainly by extending it by CDC order, not even executive order, but C, by CB, CDC order. But Cory Bush was outside and organizing demonstrations. Yet the House went home, you know, left uh, on Saturday night without even addressing it. Now Schumer is thanking her, saying that this wouldn't be possible. But the question is, why is there no action? Nobody putting forth, a, you know, a bill and calling for debate on it in Congress. R- Want to clarify, it's not a ban on all moratoriums, only if um, if you happen to be a um, – if it's for rent – uh, inability to pay rent. If there's some other reason they can get you out, the landlord can get you out uh, as long as it's not a pretext reason. And um, and secondly, you got to basically show that you've been affected by it. And I believe there's even an additional restriction with this latest extension that you've got to be in a community that has been su- su- uh, sufficiently impacted. And I'm not sure what the threshold is or how, how that's measured um, for this to take effect. It's kind of convoluted, um, you know, as to what's going to happen. I'm sure it's going to be challenged in court right away. We'll see how quickly it makes it up to the Supreme Court. Um, but maybe, I don't know, if maybe it'll be over 30 days or maybe Congress will pass something else um, that would be harder to be overturned. Yeah, so just to complement, um, you know, some of the things that you said, the Supreme Court did issue a, a, a warning that um, this type of change requires congressional action. And I think Brett Kavanaugh even wrote in his concurring opinion on the vote that uh, this would extend, this would expand too far the powers of the executive branch. Like even he thinks there's some limits to the executive power is basically what he was saying. This is this goes a bridge too far. Um, also, uh, you were talking about how did the CDC, uh, you know, identify which areas. It's basically they did a map of the whole country and places where COVID Delta is, you know, expanding terribly they got a red zone you know it's a map that's got extremely affected severely affected moderately affected like the 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 different degrees so it's those top three categories of uh communities like ours here ours is in the red zone we have a you know tremendous delta outbreak just like most of the southeast of the u.s is tremendous states like missouri tennessee arkansas florida um we're, we're right there with them in terms of how terrible our outbreak is um so the um 
President Biden's order basically said um, if it's it would be detrimental to the public to the existing public health control measures that are currently aimed at slowing COVID. So there's that public health justification, which could give it some credibility or or traction in in a, in a review situation. And even the director of the CDC said this, you know, because why why would why did we do this extension now? What what's the imperative justification, the exigent circumstance? And the reason was uh, mass evictions would be very difficult to reverse. Um, so there's that. That's the why. But in terms of like why not? So you were like, well, why didn't Congress address it? What what you know? Why did this just kind of rot uh, on swing on the vine? You know, whatever, without any without anybody going to to this really fruitful conversation uh, of about 10 million or so people who could conceivably be thrown in the street um, because they didn't pay rent over the last year and a half. Well, part of this is that over 50 or nearly $50 billion was already allocated for states. So states have access to nearly $50 billion to help uh, pay back rent. And it has to be a negotiation between the tenant and the landlord. So it's a complicated thing. They made this a very complicated and hard to access money, so much so that like less than $5 billion of it actually made it to people. So the president and the and his team or, or you know Democrats in general, their strategy group, they looked at it and they said, there's $45 billion on the table that we could just, if we could just get it in people's hands, we could push the issue with the negotiations. As of right now, people don't really kind of want to, people still weren't going back to work work because they didn't have to in many cases. Landlords didn't want to settle for a haircut on the amount owed, which was a requirement of getting this money. So there was little incentive to move. And in, with tenants not wanting to say, I've got a plan, and with landlords not wanting to say, I've got a plan, there wasn't much Congress could do. Um, but there was a group within the Democratic Party that pressuring the president to do something. And I think this was the, the workaround was a public health justification. Yeah, well, it's I mean, it's, it's tough because, again, you can only re, you can't really rewrite what Congress set up in terms of the um, uh, the administration of it. And yes, it's a cumbersome process, takes a long time, um, you know, and people need to make their mortgage payments. Landlords need to make their mortgage payments before, you know, and not have to be waiting that much time. It should have been a streamlined process. OK, maybe a little bit of fraud would uh, would, would be committed, catch up with them later and nail them. But um, but you got to let that money out that that only, you know, five percent of the money, pardon me, ten uh, percent of the money, uh, you know, got out is really just you know one of the more disappointing aspects of this whole thing. If if the if the landlord can be paid, or you have a um, a default moratorium, you know, if you'd extended that, so that there can't be um, uh, but the the uh, foreclosures, but somebody's going to get hurt, right? You you got to have the money there to give relief to somebody. Um, and, um, and and it's got to happen. And so, you know, it never got perfected. I think everybody was hoping we'd be climbing out of it by now instead of yeah. sliding back in. Um, and a lot of questions about the schools now, you know, and one of the reasons people aren't going back to work is, so is what do you do with your kids? You, know, you right. can't leave them home. So it's, um, so they can't, they can't really close down the schools at this point without serious economic issues. So, you know, anyway, I mean, it's, you know, everything is a, you know, a cluster F. I mean, it's just, it's, it's really in a bad situation right now. I think they just went to, wanted to buy some time, keep maintaining the status quo, buying time. But that's another month that landlords aren't paying their, their mortgage if they're not collecting rent. So yeah, I, I, sorry, I was gonna say I forgot to mention yeah. this earlier, but um, I think it's a 60 day extension and there was originally talk of more, um, but I could be mistaken, but that's what I heard right. last night. Um, and so some people were saying we need a four month extension, but then everybody right. said, well, what are you going to do? Throw everybody in the street for Christmas. So yeah. we're not actually going to be able to extend it four months. The money's already there. We need some pressure on people to, to spend the money or, or work out a solution. Uh, we're not going to wait until Christmas and we, we got to do something. So I think that's where they came up with the, the two months was, well, right. you know, gets us part of the way there. I, you know, again, uh, well, you know, brings us back to, you know, the, the topic of the Delta variant, you know, if people, if we had the vaccines and, and we could be on track for reopening the economy, we could, um, solve some of this, but I, you know, what, what about the fact that the tax, um, you know, that, that the enhanced uh, unemployment is about to expire? Yeah. Um, you know, so anyway, it's just, it's, um, I, we, they can't extend that without more money. 
Um, and, um, it, it, and meanwhile, a lot of people don't even qualify for unemployment anymore. Um, it's just, it's a, uh, anyway, it, it, it is a, a difficult situation. Uh, what is the answer? I don't know. But Cori Bush definitely kept it in the news. I mean, that's, yeah. uh, you know, she is sort of the new star right now. And, um, you know, we'll see what and she's gotten compliments from everybody from Schumer to even a few Republicans. And so, um, you know, she kept the issue alive. But Congress has got to get this infrastructure bill passed and then sit down and say, what are we going to do about this, the the, the uh, coronavirus now? And, even you know, even if we supported here. One of the problems we have is you can have resolved in one country. This is kind of going back to the other one, but the world is having a problem with the coronavirus right now. People aren't in a position to buy our goods or, you know, or bring or, or sell us the resources or, and all of that. And they're trying to open up to bring international students back into the United States. But uh, Chinese students especially are afraid because of the craziness around that. So anyway, the reopening is, is, uh, uh, slowed up a bit uh, until there's some kind of break on the Delta variant, um, you know, and I, I haven't heard anything about a vaccine specifically geared towards it uh, coming anytime soon. So, uh, so just res with respect to uh, Corey Bush, by all means, yeah, she's the she's the uh, you know rock star of the week supposedly. I did see some dancing going on out in front of Congress, and I also saw you know Elizabeth Warren came running out and Schumer came running out. There were like you did this, you know, and one of the things that Elizabeth Warren said was, she said, well, when I first got to Congress, I wondered, um, does it matter that it's me or am I just another body? Like, am I mm -hmm. actually adding to this? Like, what am I even doing here? And, and she just said, Corey, I just want you to know that you made a difference. You, you personally, it's that you're just not a placeholder. You're not just a representative. You're a, you know, you, you did this and this is an inspiration. So there's that inspiration piece piece. And then lastly, when it comes to what you mentioned about Corona itself, um, there's talk about a booster shot. There's talk about the increased efficacy. Both Germany and Israel have already ordered another round of uh, a third shot for people because the drop off in effectiveness after six months is statistically valid enough. About eighty three percent. Yeah. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna probably see that as a way to make sure that teachers are happy or, or sufficiently happy to go back into the classroom. Today, we celebrate the triumph, not of a candidate, but of a cause, the cause of democracy. We are going to raise issues that, you know, historically have not been raised. What about the nuclear option, doing away with the filibuster? I can tell you that would be the end of the Senate as it was originally devised. All of this is possible for America. Who was standing in the way? Mitch McConnell. Where an insurrection that sought to overturn an election, when that failed, the action moved into state capitals. Okay, in, in local sp elections that have national significance, Ohio held uh, special primaries. Everybody was looking at two races: um, one uh, for for the um, uh, for their state legislature. Uh, one involved a Trump-backed candidate, uh, Mike Carey. Um, he, he, Trump had uh, his, his back candidate had lost uh, horribly in Texas. They were wondering, you know, a lot of questions of whether or not his clout was being lost. Uh, Mike Carey was up against a, a slew of other Republicans, but came out significantly in front of the closest one. This is seen as maybe his brand name isn't as compromised as it was. And then you had another classical, you know, um, mainline uh, Democrat, ver establishment Democrat versus uh, progressive. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, the, it's, the, the battles have kind of gone back and forth. This one went to Chantel Brown over Nina Turner, who had been favored to win it. Um, but Chantel Brown had a message um, that, you know, we first of all, Nia, uh, Turner had, had made a big mistake of, you know, talking about voting for Biden being like eating ex excrement. That got used against her a lot. But also uh, something that progressives are really going to have to think about um, was, you know, that Chantel Brown brought up was defund the police and, and said that it's the reason Democrats, you know, didn't make gains in Congress, you know, when they won the presidency, and um, and and there is and and um, and Clyburn came in to back her um, and um, and other Democrats, including probably the majority of the Congressional Black Caucus, 
Um, and um, and the message is, you know, you, you don't go crazy in your messaging um, because that was a key issue. Uh, defund the police was a big issue. And a lot of black voters are like saying, yeah, we don't want police defunded. We live in these communities, um, you know, so that, that defund the police is probably going to go down as one of the most counter-effective uh, slogans in a long time, you know, and, and it, it, it um, I don't you know, you know, a lot of times the feeling is that, you know, white people shouldn't criticize something that was thought up by black activists, but the fact of the matter is, is black voters are rejecting it overwhelmingly. So, you know, it, it, it white progressives can't pick and choose which people of color they're going to listen to when, when, when voters are making it really clear, you don't have a slogan that begins with defund, and then five minutes later, you're trying to explain, well, it doesn't really mean defund. You know, I mean, it's just, you, you gotta be careful about what you're saying. You gotta not be in a bubble. And, um, you know, this is a message to progressives. There, there's a reason Clyburn has been successful in rallying the working class black vote in the South and now in Ohio, um, you know, um, against, uh, in favor of the establishment Democrats and against progressives and progressives need to start learning how to listen and they need to they, and not be in their own echo chambers and thinking that that's reflective of what's out there that's that's the lesson i'm taking away from it dave yeah i mean there's so much here and i like i really do think we could talk for an hour on just this because right. because you got the two parties each have the different lessons uh so i'll go in the, the order that you spoke so first you talked about the republican party which you know, it looked like it, for all people, for, from a practical observer, it seems like the party is sort of stuck in this tractor beam where the 35 percent of the base that still supports Donald Trump is kind of the tail wagging the dog. Um, and everybody in the establishment of the Republican Party is, was not everybody, because Liz Cheney is an exception among others, but many people in the party were uh, not willing to buck the the base here. Um, and that's, you know, like you said uh, earlier in Texas, um, uh, Susan Wright was uh, endorsed by Trump, but Jake uh, Elzey ended up, um, you know, um, I guess w uh, winning. So that showed, yeah. hey, maybe maybe Trump's uh, brand is tarnished. Whereas here in Ohio last night, what we saw was that a coal lobbyist, Mike Carey, who's supported by the big money uh, energy industry folks that, and the libertarian folks that also support Trump, um, that th their candidate uh, with just about 30 odd percent of the vote ended up winning against 11 other people. So it's it basically the brand of the Trump brand is saved from from getting its name tarnished. Um, Trump himself, at, at least own, for the moment, for the moment. Yeah. yeah. Um, his own people were telling him, don't spend our money on this. Like, don't do this. I think they spent a ton of money actually at the 11th hour to try to just push this over the edge um, because Trump said so, or because, you know, his closest advisor said, no, like push your, you know, sharpen your elbows, do your thing. And, uh, and it worked here temporarily. We'll see how it plays out. Um, with respect to the democratic party, like you said, it's, uh, um, the pattern holds that the establishment is loyal and that uh, people in, you know, all politics are local, and that um, when the uh, county Democratic Party chairwoman Chantel Brown got the support of Hillary Clinton and Clyburn and the Congressional Black Caucus and her own community, that it was very difficult for uh, Nina Turner, who's a national figure uh, known as, you know, uh, firebrand of, of uh, Bernie supporting, he, he, she was Bernie's uh, communications director or co-director, and and so she's, she's said some very controversial things. She had a lot of uh, her own speech footage was used against her and yeah. it was relatively close. I mean, it was a, what, 34,000 to 30,000 yeah. or so. Um, yeah. so it's, you know, at a, if you took it, those 64,000, that's like eight ish percent or something. So, so really if there's a 20, you know, about whatever the exact number is about 2000 and change 2200 people swing their vote, it's an upset. But the upset didn't happen, and it's pretty clear why, uh, because the party held together. There was just enough of things that were controversial or or marks against her um, to that that the progressives, who really do make up a minority of the party, weren't able to to expand their their constituents. Now, whether he deserves it or not, you know, you can make arguments, but Clyburn appears to be the kingmaker. 
at this point in time. He is credited with having turned it around for Joe Biden after Bernie had had that win in Nevada and um, and, and Democratic uh, Party people um, like the raging Cajun, what's his name? Uh, James Carville. You know, James Carville were lamenting the Democrats are going to lose. We're going to lose to Trump big and, uh, and the rest. And then Clyburn uh, rallied people in South Carolina, and then a week later, or a few days late after South Carolina, um, in in throughout the South, the uh, Southern Black vote was overwhelmingly um, for for Biden, just like they had been for Hillary Clinton before. Um, and you know that's uh, that, that's uh, again the the progressive wing really needs to think about its messaging, really needs to think about its outreach. Why are uh, black voters in conservative areas not supporting their candidates? And I propose it's not because they don't relate to the political positions. I bet, I'm willing to bet that most of the black people in the South who voted for um, for Joe Biden probably would prefer Bernie Sanders' positions if they were laid out in front of them. But when you are in a state like you know Arkansas or Ohio, and you're and you're in the minority party, you want to see pragmatism, and yeah. you you don't want to see somebody saying, "Well, Fidel Castro did some good things." True, sure, everybody does good things, but that's not you. You you need somebody who's got instinct and sense to know that that's going to have a negative impact. I think that's where Bernie lost the nomination. By the way, it was that following week. So, um, lesson for progressives. I'll let you close this out. Yeah, I mean, you, you, I said loyalty. You said pragmatism, and I would say that they're both uh, two two sides of the of the story here. Um, but but it's it's the it's the determinative pragmatism was the determinative factor here that there is a like I said there's a an establishment where people spend their careers uh, you know building coalitions getting things done and when when you you know the proverbial close the curtain behind yourself when you vote um, it, you you want to do what you think is the, the most uh, logical uh, pragmatic solution which could partially or even fully explain Eric Adams success in uh, mm -hmm. in New York and I've seen him speak and he he kind of says that he's like I you know my history speaks for itself I I say what I mean I do what I say and we're going to get things done and defund the police is he just said it's a non-starter with this core group of people so so I'm just going to agree with you here Eric, that, uh, that 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 phrasing of a reworking of police prioritization um, is it, you know it's there's a lesson there <laughs>
Okay, well, that takes a, that is the end of the show. You've been watching Redwood Wonk, Dave Frank, myself, Eric Kirk. We will be back next week. I'm and probably you know I don't know maybe the the bipartisan infrastructure bill will have passed by that time, but who knows. Thank <laughs> you.